Hi guys. Um, so I know the majority of the people in this room, so this will be nice and easy. Um, although I practiced this last night and I got nervous in front of my wife, so <laughs> we'll see how I do. Um, threw a quick QR code up here just to be cool. Um, if you scan it, it just has my, my personal information, which is on this here slide. <laughs> and there's Therese. Um, so anyway, my name is Albert Volkman and I'm a senior software developer at Media Current. Um, by the way, quick plug, we're currently hiring, so if you know anybody who is looking to further their Drupal career, feel free to send me an email at that email address, and or you can contact me on my Drupal.org uh, contact page. Come on in. Um, so today, I just want to talk a little bit about goals, and specifically goals that I've set for myself, and the uh, challenges that I've taken, the challenges that I've come across as I work toward those goals. I think uh, health is definitely something that's overlooked a lot of times as a developer because the majority of our day we spend hunched over a computer typing away and um, you're sitting usually with bad posture and uh, slowly getting um, unhealthy. So I'd like to just talk a little bit about the things that I've done to uh, work toward bettering those goals or working toward being healthier. Uh, so, uh, about nine years ago, um, I had just graduated college and I was, I had just finished that goal and I was looking for my next big goal. And uh, initially I thought the goal was to move to California and start the next amazing startup, million dollar startup, it's Facebook or whatever, but uh, life took me a different way. I met this beautiful girl um, and she brought me down to Florida um, and a few years later, I married that girl. Yeah. Uh, yay! <laughs> Um, so, uh, my wife and I um, were both very type A, um, goal-oriented people, and up until the point before we were married, we were making our own goals and working toward those goals, and now as a couple, we started working on goals together. Um, got Carl from uh, Garden State to help me out here. <laughs> do you all have dreams? I know I do. Um, so we started working on our common goals and we started asking questions like uh, where, where do we want to go uh, travel to, what, what, uh, what kind of things are we going to do as a, as a, as a couple and uh, what kind of people we want to be, how we want to pursue our faith, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Um, and one of the big things that we first came across handling was our debt and uh, we came across a, a process called Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University. which. If you guys haven't heard about that, it's really great. Uh, we were able to pay off our debt in a couple of years, and it's actually something we're still working on. Uh, we, we still budget every month our money, but uh, we have a, a goal to work toward to uh, make sure that we're being good stewards of our money. Um, so during that process, while we were um, working on paying off our debt, we also um, realized another goal of ours was health, and obviously that's the, the point of this conversation. Uh, on both of the sides of our family, we both have uh, a history of health issues between um, uh, my, actually my grandmother died of breast cancer, and, or she had breast cancer and then she died later, it wasn't directly related, but, um, and then my wife's father has some health issues and my mom's mom has health issues, so uh, we were looking at this and realizing that this wasn't the path that we wanted to take with our lives. So we started identifying what kind of what goals we needed to work toward to to make the health a priority in our life. <laughs> so if uh, we're defining our hook, just to make this a little bit geeky. Um, the the signature of our hook uh, accepts one argument, and the argument is your life. And uh, the uh, the first instance we're going to discuss within that is going to be exercise. And uh, we have a, a patch file here to hopefully patch your life to make you a healthier, better person. Um, so, this section we're going to talk about exercise. Um, so, when before we got married, actually leading up to our, our wedding, my wife identified that she wanted to look really good in her wedding dress. So we hired a personal trainer, and she started going three times a week. Um, at first, I didn't go because I was like, ah, you know, I exercise, I run, you know, I'm, I'm a healthy guy. Um, but she pulled me in, and we started going, and I was realizing that that was a good, uh, a good thing to kind of stick to. Uh, we had also had a, a wide membership um, that we had. We actually had a free membership, but you know, that's besides the point. 
Um, but having that Y membership, we would go uh, every once in a while, but we wouldn't go consistently because, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure if you guys have memberships, but it's one of those cards you stick in your back pocket and you think about going every once in a while. <laughs> And if you really think about going to a gym, the, the idea of going to a gym is kind of boring. You're driving to a location, you're walking in, you're just like running on a machine inside a building for an hour or two, depending on how long you work out. And to me, that's not really interesting, and it's not really a driving force to work out. So by having this personal trainer, um, which was actually affordable, that was one of my concerns, was that I, I've heard about trainers being really expensive, but we were able to find a trainer that didn't charge a whole lot, um, and so I worked out well. We were able to budget it into our, our budget. Um, and since we were, we were paying a little bit higher than you would for a gym membership, uh, and we had a set time, we were always sure to go. So um, right now we, we go on Thursday mornings. That's 8 o'clock in the morning. So I have to get up a little extra early and drive up to Maitland, and uh, we work out. So um, it makes sure that we stay consistent. And, and our workout session is really short. Uh, we just have a half hour where usually just lifting weights, and, um, just quick, get there, get out, and we're done. So it doesn't eat up my day. And usually whenever I come back home and I start working, I'm more energized because I've got my workout done. My day's ready to go. Um, so uh, coupled with going to the gym, uh, one of the things I mentioned a little bit ago is running. Running's always been a big part of my health routine. Uh, for me, it's a, it's a great stress reliever. Um, when you have your, your day with your client and uh, they've asked you the same question for the fifth time or uh, uh, are you just, you're dealing with maybe a, a coding problem that just doesn't make sense in your head, I found that for me, like running, I was just able to either forget about the day, maybe work through that problem, and just, it was a good break from the day. Um, and obviously running is a really simple activity, so uh, I was talking about the investment of a membership or a gym membership. Like, I didn't have to go anywhere. I just would get done working, put on my gym shorts, throw on my shoes, run out the door, and for a half an hour to an hour, I was just it was just me in the road. <laughs> and uh, I had a, as a really tangible goal too. So uh, I typically try to run about three miles when I run. So I start off with that goal and I complete that goal. And that's not. Whereas like with a coding problem that's still hanging out in my head. <laughs> It, it, that has a definitive endpoint. Um, so, uh, and one of the other really cool things about running for me was that I, I've been using the RunKeeper app on my phone, and uh, I've been using it for three and a half, four years now. So I have a history. And I can look back and see the the challenges that I've faced, like the ups and downs of how far I was able to run, how fast I was able to run. So being a being a nerd, I was able to really enjoy those numbers. So another thing that I identified for myself was that um, sitting at a desk all day wasn't necessarily comfortable. Uh, typically when I'm sitting at the desk, I'm shifting around, propping my feet up, putting them down, putting them underneath me, kind of just basically fidgeting around. And um, I found that by adding a standing desk to the mix, I was able to uh, kind of vary my uh, day. I'm not just sitting at the desk all day, it's kind of wasting away. Um, Obviously, standing desks are really popular right now, and I did a lot of research trying to find a standing desk that was uh, affordable. And initially, all I did was actually, I, I grabbed a cardboard box, I sat on top of the kitchen table, set my laptop on it, and there was my standing desk. So, zero dollars. Of course, my wife didn't like that, and she started researching <laughs> all these uh, different standing desk options, and we found one that works pretty well, and it was, it was about $100 total. So the reason for a stand desk is also, besides the fact that we're, we're not sitting down all day, um, we're, our bodies aren't really designed to sit in, in the contour position. Uh, if you think about our ancestors, the majority of the time they were running around scavenging for food, they weren't sitting at a computer. Um, so now our bodies are adapting to this new kind of paradigm in uh, our day-to-day -day activities. Um, and I would say we're not adapting very well. <laughs> As you can see uh, with the obesity epidemic in the United States and whatnot. Um, so some interesting stats about setting. When you do set down, your body's m metabolic rate drops down to one calorie per minute. So you're just kind of, your breathing slows down and you're, 
you're just you're just not burning any you're not exerting any energy sitting there so uh, also your, your good cholesterol drops 20 percent and the effectiveness effectiveness of your insulin drops so there's just a lot of really negative things ultimately to your health uh, the great thing about standing too it's you know, instant passive exercise uh, my wife laughs at me a lot because I'll be standing at my desk and I'll have some music on and I'm dancing around <laughs> And obviously, I, I work from home, so I can get away with that without getting made fun of too much. But obviously, my wife gives me a hard time. Um, so, uh, and also, I mean, standing all day, a lot of people will think about that and go, "Wow, aren't your legs going to get tired?" But you don't have to stand all day. Um, it's good to mix up. Like, I'll, I'll have my computer up on my standing desk. I'll be working for an hour and a half. Feel like I'm getting tired. Set the computer down on the table and sit down. And there's definitely nothing wrong with that. Just mixing it up. It's actually probably even better. Um, oh, and then I listed 10,000 steps up here. Um, I, I read something about how in order to be an active person, uh, you need to do 10,000 steps a day. And I like to think like mm -hmm. the day during my dancing, <laughs> taking little steps. So kind of working toward that goal. So this actually ties back into, I just threw the order of my slides are a little bit out of place, but this was going to tie into running before. But um, I just want to say, obviously, the solutions that I'm providing today kind of seem non just common sense, and I'm not doing anything groundbreaking here. Uh, the idea is just to to find activities that work well for you. Um, obviously, running worked well for me just because I've been doing it all along. But if there's something else that you enjoy and you look forward to doing, uh, that that enjoyment is going to cause you to continue to do that. So instead of, or instead of worrying about going to the gym or you know, forcing yourself to do these things that you don't really enjoy, which you're ultimately not going to do, uh, if you find something that you enjoy, you're, you're going to be driven to do it. Scootering count? Scootering counts. <laughs> Good push. <laughs> um, so yeah, just the, the, the goal here is just consistency. And I'm definitely bad at it too. Something I struggle with all the time. Uh, there's there's weeks that go by where I'm looking at my run keeper log and I realize I haven't run in a week or two, and then that, that for me that's a good tool to go hey you know I need to run. <laughs> um, so yeah, just finding the tools that work well for you, and, and we'll talk a little bit more toward the end. I'd, I'd be interested to hear what what you guys have found that have worked well for you. All right, so now that we talked about exercise, we're going to move on to your diet. And when I say diet, I'm, I'm not talking about Jenny Craig or Weight Watchers. Um, just talking about your, your day to day intake of what food you choose to put into your body. Um, my wife is a really big advocate for this. Um, she has the, uh, the chance throughout the day to do a lot of research on different health blogs, and she's constantly learning about the evils of Monsanto and all the genetically modified foods that were being fed. And I could probably do a whole talk just on that, but. Uh, so, one of the first things I want to talk about with your diet um, that's, that I incorporated was removing caffeine from my diet. I know it's a big shock for a lot of developers because we run on caffeine, right? Um, I removed caffeine on my diet probably about five or six years ago. And at first it was really hard because I would have meetings and the first thing I would do is grab a cup of coffee and, or have a soda or you know, whatever. And the withdrawal period of removing caffeine from your diet is pretty difficult. You get some pretty bad headaches and it'll last for a week or two. I mean, at least it does for me. Um, and also, it was hard for me to give up caffeine because I, I know that um, caffeinated coffee tastes a lot better than decaf coffee. I don't know if you guys are big coffee drinkers, but decaf coffee normally has like kind of a metallic taste to it. And so, in researching that, I actually found out why it has that metallic taste. And, it's the process that coffee is put through to remove caffeine that they use uh, certain chemicals. And so in that search I found that you can get Swiss water decaffeinated coffee and that's what you need to look for, Swiss water decaffeinated. Uh, there are some coffees that say that they're water decaffeinated but they still use chemicals in that water. So that doesn't necessarily mean that they're chemical free. Mm -hmm. so, um, so uh, then that way I was still able to enjoy coffee without the um, concerns of caffeine. Um, 
a lot of caffeinated drinks, I'm sure Dave can attest to, back in the Mind Comet days. My energy drink pyramid. <laughs> uh, they all include usually either lots of sugars or extra things in them that, uh, it, I could, again, I could probably do a whole talk just about sugar. The effects that it has on your body actually are similar to cocaine, which sounds kind of crazy, but the way your brain reacts to sugar, uh, it develops the same addictive properties and the same, just the same, uh, yeah, just addiction that cocaine does. Um, and with the, also the negative side of the ups and downs throughout the day, um, you have your coffee in the morning, tail off, have your coffee in the afternoon after lunch, tail off, and find yourself falling asleep with the keyboard. But after I remove caffeine, I, I feel like I have a pretty even energy level throughout the day. Obviously, it makes sense with the exercise. It helps out a lot. And of course, once you remove all these sugary and caffeinated drinks, you can replace that with water. <laughs> it's exciting. It's wet. It tastes great. <laughs> So, um, also going down the route of just having a consistent energy throughout the day, one of the steps that I took toward maintaining energy was uh, incorporating snacking throughout my day and making, making purposeful snacking a part of it. Uh, it helps. Typically, whenever you're eating something, within two hours you're going to be hungry. Uh, you're, that's how long it takes your body to process the food that you eat. So, if you think about if you're going to eat breakfast at 9 o'clock in the morning, and then you're gonna wait till one o'clock, twelve o'clock, one o'clock to, to eat lunch. That's beyond the, the two hour period. You're, you're gonna be hungry, and you're gonna reach for that candy bar, or that that snack machine, or you know whatever whatever your advice is. And so I just decided to incorporate this in my day. Uh, I will get up in the morning, do my work, you know, have my breakfast, do my work for two hours, take a break, eat a snack, work for two hours, eat lunch. Continue that throughout the day that way. Uh, you also get the added benefit of like you do two hours of work and that work is done. It's like a, a kind of a, a slotted thing and the day doesn't seem so over overwhelming. It's just I just need to make it through these two hour blocks. So I definitely recommend trying that if it's something you guys are interested in. Um, so with those snacks, um, some examples for me that I've been doing is uh, our fruit and vegetables. Of course, be really careful with fruits, even though they're, they're natural sugars, they're still sugars. So you'll, you'll want to make sure you pair one of those sugars with a, a protein so that your body doesn't spike. Um, also eat a lot of raw foods, like different nuts. Um, I actually have a, a allergy to pecans, so I don't eat those, but like cashews and peanuts and whatnot. And I, also hummus is a great, definitely a great snack. So, tying back in with Monsanto, um, my wife has done a lot of research, and I have as well, on uh, just buying locally and buying chemical-free. Uh, we've slowly worked over the years to remove all the chemicals out of our house. We actually don't even have any cleaning materials that we use um, uh, that are natural. And we, we do clean our house, it's not disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we found as we started incorporating these organic foods into our diet, um, and then trying to go back to non-organic foods, it, it, the food just tastes better. Um, if you try to, if I, if I were to eat like, a, I don't want to sound like an organic snob, but if I were to eat a, a canned, uh, some canned green beans, I would, it just wouldn't taste good to me at all anymore. Um, your body just kind of adapts to the, the freshness of local organic foods. Um, and also by buying local and organic, we're, we're helping push down Monsanto, I mean, the evil corporation, <laughs> uh, which I don't want to go too far into. Um, talking about the, the nutrition, obviously the, the local foods that you get, um, they're farm to table, so there's less time for the nutrients to, to seep out of the foods that you're eating. And it's also more sustainable, uh, if you think about Whenever we buy here in Florida, an orange from California, that there was a truck that had to ship that all the way from California to here just so we can enjoy it. But here we live in Florida with amazing oranges, so why do we need California oranges? So, um, you're, by buying local, you're, you're helping save the earth a little bit. Um, I, mean, I had some notes here too, just talking about uh, the benefits 
uh, or sorry, some of the, the movies that I've seen that kind of go down this route of why these things are good. Uh, some of the movies I would I'd like to present would be uh, Food Matters, Fresh, Forks Over Knives, and Fat Sick and Nearly Dead. And I'll, I don't think I include those all in my links at the end, but I'll, I'll add those. Um, just be mindful that some of those are pretty shocking. There's this one scene actually where there's a, a guy reaching inside of a cow's stomach, which is really disgusting, but as long as you have a strong stomach for a, some of those, just be prepared. Um, okay, so the, the big thing about just eating healthy is just being aware of what, what you're putting in your body. Uh, one of the things I had never heard of before uh, was a thing called shopping the perimeter. <clears throat> shopping the perimeter. And all that basically consists of is whenever you go to your local Publix or your grocery store, um, instead of going down the middle, middle aisles, they actually shop the perimeter. Uh, generally around the perimeter is where you're going to find all the fresh vegetables, the meats, cheeses, milks, dairies, whatnot. Um, and the great thing about buying those fresh vegetables and whatnot, you're, you're staying away from all the processed foods. Um, yeah. Um, so, in the end of those processed foods, if you look at the majority of the ingredients on the back, you can't pronounce half of them. And uh, our rule of thumb is if you can't pronounce it, generally it's probably not good to eat. Um, also, you'll see across a lot of the, the foods, they all include a high fructose corn syrup. Uh, this reminds me of this commercial actually where uh, there's these two women that are sitting there and she's saying, I use high fructose corn syrup. And haven't you heard how bad that is? And you're like, that is just the same as sugar. And, and they, they basically just dog the, the woman who was against high fructose, high fructose corn syrup. But the fact is actually the high fructose corn syrup is made from corn that's genetically modified where our body doesn't, genetically modified foods are foods that your body can't process. So ultimately, it's not good. <laughs> um, also, a lot of foods include nitrites. Uh, there's been studies which nitrites cause cancer. You'll find those a lot in processed meats like hot dogs and, and the sober. Um, also another included thing in a lot of foods is hydrogenated oils which have shown to cause heart disease, nutritional deficiencies, um, etc. Um, moving on. Uh, one of the things that my wife really struggled with when we um, first getting married, she was realizing that she would eat uh, bread and get a stomach ache afterwards. And we never really connected those two until we went to a nutritionist. And we found out that my wife actually has a gluten allergy. Um, and there's actually a, a large part of the population that now has a gluten allergy, which seems kind of strange because you, you think about like bread is consistent across all cultures. Uh, if you go to India, you get um, they have, you know, their, their, what's it called, pan? Or non. Non. And, you know, every, every culture has their own form of bread, and the idea of removing bread out of your diet just seems really foreign. Um, so we, we started researching that and finding out why, why gluten is bad for you. Because, um, I mean, gluten's a naturally occurring thing, so why, why would it not be good for you? Um, so we found out some really interesting things. Uh, whenever you hear the hear about when we first came to America they talk about the amber waves of grain and grain actually originally was these nine foot tall stalks with tiny little germ heads on the top and we would the people that came and settled the area would spend all day thrashing this just to make a small amount of bread so over over time we went and um, worked to make a the stalks shorter and the wheat germ bigger and in that process we've created a wheat that our body doesn't know how to process. And there's been a lot of studies that show that there's been, a, due to this altered structure of gliadin proteins, and uh, the gliadin sequence that uh, there's been, the, when your body starts processing that, it actually develops celiac disease, which is an extreme form of gluten intolerance. Um, so that helps explain a little bit why like we didn't really see these people who were gluten-free, and gluten-free is a real thing. I, I think there was a really funny SNL skit that I watched recently, like your made-up issue, like gluten intolerance. But, um, so, it's my little soapbox about gluten. Uh, soy is also a big, 
uh, offender. Um, soy, I think 90% of the soy that's produced in America is genetically modified. And um, even though soy is generally pretty good, it's, it's high in estrogen, but it's, it's a, a pretty good food. Just the fact that it's genetically modified kind of removes a lot of those health benefits. Um, so moving on from food, uh, this is actually a really relevant story for me. Um, antiperspirants are unhealthy for you. And I'm not saying don't put on deodorant screen, because I know we don't want to stink. But um, I had a, a good friend of mine who uh, had an abscess grow underneath this armpit, as gross as that is. And uh, he had to be rushed to the hospital. Luckily, they, they did a study, or did a test on the, uh, the abscess and found out the, the tumor that was growing underneath his armpit was benign, and they were able to remove it. But they found out that the, the cause for that abscess, uh, for the doctor's recommendation, was deodorant. Um, whenever, you're, whenever you use antiperspirant on your armpit, the way it works is uh, there's little bits of aluminum that go in and block the pores that are in your arm. And so that keeps the, your body from releasing all the toxins that are in your body. So over time, your body is just storing up all those toxins in that area, which obviously for my friend was almost life-threatening. So um, something to think about. We, we switched to natural deodorants and and you don't stink. I don't, I don't think I stink. Uh, so that's something to, to consider. Um, also, shampoos. Um, that's something you probably don't really think about, but every day when we're showering, we're, we're putting chemicals directly into our scalp. And uh, there's a, a big offender here in a lot, of, a lot of shampoos. Actually, it's the active ingredient in shampoos, which is sodium lauryl sulfate. Uh, it's the same stuff that you use to clean like concrete floors and uh, degrease engines um, and also does a really good job at removing the grease from your, your hair. However, it's, it's, known, it's known as a mutagen and in sufficient amounts it's been uh, capable of changing the genetic material found in cells. Um, it's, caused, or it's, it's actually induced mutations in bacteria too. So anytime you think about that, like mutations in cells, that's typically a, a red flag, right? That's, that's not good cancer. Um, so something to, to think about as well. And again, uh, amongst all this stuff, like uh, it's really just good to ask questions. Um, that's part of the, the awareness aspect, making sure that you know what you're putting in or on your body and being sure that you know the, as, much as, as much as you can the ramifications of what those things are going to do to you. A little seminary. <laughs> All right, so now we've talked about exercise and diet. So I want to talk a little bit about the, the the mental things that you can do, or things you can do to help your mental well-being during your day. One of the things that I, I really struggle with, um, especially working from home, is having clear definitions of when the workday ends and when relaxing begins. And um, it's really easy just to in my evening to grab my laptop and start working on a problem that's been bugging me all day that I may have new clarity on. Um, but I find when I do that, I have lower satisf satisfaction in both working and, and relaxing. So at what I've been working toward, and, and this isn't always true, um, at the end of the day, five or six o'clock, depending on when I start, I, I shut my laptop, put my laptop away, and I go spend time with my wife. And obviously there's the benefits of building a relationship with your significant other. Um, for those of us that have, that find relaxation through computers, which uh, me being one of them as well, um, I, I find that it's good just to change your physical location. So uh, I mentioned earlier, whenever I work, I'm working at our, our dining room table. I, I step away from the dining room table and I move to the couch. <laughs> Obviously it, it's a good idea to get away from a computer, but if you're gonna do that, just that, that physical act of changing locations, or maybe if you have a different computer, your gaming computer, you move to that, that just allows your, your body to create a, a mental break point from this, this is when I'm working, this is when I'm getting my job done, and now I'm, I'm relaxing. Um, so some of the activities that I like to do, I, we watch TV, so we're, we're not super health nuts, like we definitely uh, follow a lot of TV series that are kind of nice to help unwind from the day. Um, my wife and I like to go on walks, um, we read books and um, 
do different things, like different activities, uh, you know, like married couples do. Um, during your day, uh, one of my concerns is that uh, I'll get a, a link from a friend or a really interesting YouTube video, and I'll find myself quickly sucked into that. Um, and before you know it, one quick two minute video becomes an hour of learning about something crazy. <laughs> Sorry. So, thanks, Dave. <laughs> um, so, uh, the great thing about YouTube is that's got that little clock down the bottom right. You click that as long as you're logged in. You can just save that for later. So when we do have those periods of relaxation, it gives you great fodder just to sit down and work through those videos. And obviously, we, uh, all modern browsers have bookmarks or a bookmarking system. So star it and save it for later. Uh, big, the big offender for me is Google Reader, even though it's shortly going away. Of course, now Feedly has supplanted that. Um, I'll find myself any time that I need like a little bit of downtime during my day to quickly open up a tab and start reading about the latest news. And obviously, that's a, a scary, scary black hole of of uh, information. And social sites, I'm sure a lot of people struggle with Facebook and Google Plus and the like. So, and, and those things aren't bad. It's just you know, just make sure that um, you're you're defining when that relaxation time is and when work time is. Uh, another thing I've discovered as I've gotten older that I used to be able to do better when I was younger uh, was multitask. And uh, nowadays, whenever I try to multitask, I typically will forget. I'll have multiple tabs of projects that I'm working on. And as I switch between the tabs, I have to reassociate myself with whatever issue I was working on. Uh, same thing with like a terminal window. I'm like, well, which server am I on? Like, Am I in production or am I in staging? Yeah. Uh, so for me, what I found is that I really needed to hone in and just focus on um, one activity. Obviously, if you have a, a long running migration that isn't requiring a lot of mental effort, you can push that to the side. But it, I work a lot better in general if I just have a series of work uh, that's sort of in front of me and I just work through that one task at a time. Also, so during, the, your, during your downtime, um, one of the things I, I'll get a little plug for tomorrow actually, uh, it's good to give back to the Drupal community. And for me, this, this gives me some, uh, if you're thinking about the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it gives me a, a greater sense of purpose uh, beyond just doing client work. Um, when I have that downtime, I'm able to uh, just, just work on things that are really, like you're scratching your own itch, like problems that are bugging you about. Um, something that you didn't like about Drupal, and so it's a nice little plug for tomorrow's um, contribution or sprint that we're doing tomorrow. So, if you guys are interested, show up tomorrow. Um, it's a it's a great way to spend your free time, and you're ultimately just benefiting yourself. So, um, So we've discussed all these things that you can do to, to better yourself, and now we're going to take um, those things and uh, help others. And this is definitely a great a chance to, to lead in your, your sphere of influence. Um, one of the things that I started doing at our company is uh, we have an internal chat, which Yammer is actually the, the, the product we use. And I've been trying to share goals that I've set for myself on a weekly basis and maybe at the end of the week to say and how well I did. Obviously, I'm, I'm far from perfect, so I'll be like, oh, my goal was to run three times this week, I only ran twice. And my hope is that other people will kind of join in as well, and uh, we'll be able to help spur each other on, and um, just become a, a harbinger for health and be a role model. Um, it's a great way to learn about your coworkers, too. Um, you can find out what activities they're interested in, and um, it's, it's a great team building. Um, so another thing that I've done is uh, we, like I was mentioned, run keeper. <clears throat> I got all of our our teammates to all of them, some of them to sign up with a run keeper, and we're able to share and see each other's progress throughout the week. And the cool thing about run keeper is it does more than just running. There's some people that like to cycle, and 
do different activities. So uh, that way we're kind of able to hold each other accountable and help each other out. Um, also, it's, you can get, it's good to like kind of look for local opportunities. Um, just last week, I got the chance to run the Iowa 5K. Um, great way to get in touch with the community, and you know, I was running with 16,000 other people, so it's, it's kind of this really energizing thing to, to be in this group with a common goal, just to complete this run. Uh, yeah, a lot of fun. So, um, that's pretty much my, my, or my talk. Uh, I hope it wasn't too boring. Um, the, all these things, uh, like I said, are, are really common sense for the most part, and uh, I'm really interested to hear what you guys have done in your own lives to kind of work toward your health goals. Um, so yeah. Um, uh, next slide. Just want to say, talking about goals. This is my next <laughs> upcoming challenge. <laughs> Something I'm really excited about. Um, coming in early June. So uh, I have a feeling that this is going to add to the complexity of my uh, my workout regimen. After I was up four times throughout the night, feeding the baby and changing the fifteenth diaper. Uh, and it's going to be more of a challenge for me to place on those shoes and go for the run. But I'm excited and I accept the challenge and it's going to help me grow. Uh, one last slide. Uh, I just want to throw in this comment from my coworker Andrew. <laughs> uh, and there's no hook grave altar, so use hook health altar instead. So that's my talk. And uh, I'd like to open up if you guys have any questions or thoughts about what you guys have done for your health. You didn't talk about some of the things you should do, such as there's been many articles in papers and magazines lately supposedly written by doctors that tell you to eat dark chocolate every day mm -hmm. and have a beer every day. Sounds good. <laughs> okay. And then there's a few other things like that that have been discussed. So yeah. You do any of those? Uh, I do eat dark chocolate, um, usually 80% or greater. And what, what was it, what, what, what you read, what did it say? Like it was saying that... A beer or a drink every day. They're saying that they were good or bad? It's good. Oh, it's good, yeah. I like beer. <laughs> I, the, I hadn't heard the beer, I had heard wine. Um, wine. Red, yeah. red specifically, I think, yeah. for the antioxidants, same as the dark chocolate. Now, and you, you need to look out for the nitrates as well, where they get a lot of red wine. So, so Dark, dark chocolate, like 80% or greater, also has caffeine. Has a great amount of caffeine, um, I, I've heard that's actually a fallacy. Okay. Um, it, it doesn't actually have the high, I don't, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I read that actually it doesn't have the high levels of caffeine that people think that it does. Okay. Uh, and also, dark chocolate at first is pretty jarring when you start eating it. Uh, most of us are probably used to milk chocolate. and like. The, the process it took me to start eating a dark chocolate, I was, the first time I ate it was like, wow, this is really bitter and terrible. <laughs> yeah. But then over time, your, your, your taste buds adapt to it and you actually start tasting like the subtleties of chocolate, the actual chocolate, because chocolate is just cacao and then we <laughs> add sugar to it. <laughs> um, so, cacao. Uh, so, yeah, any other questions? There's one thing I was doing for a while, uh I was working on just a laptop screen, my eyes started to hurt. Okay. I realized uh, if I didn't change something soon, then it was probably you know, thin in my eyes. And I found a little app called Timeout. I think it was called Timeout. And it just runs a timer, and every so often uh, you, know, you set the intervals, mm -hmm. and uh, it'll kind of dim your screen a little bit and uh, remind you to look away. Oh, nice. That was cool. Yeah, that's definitely a concern. I mean, when you're staring at a computer screen, you don't blink, blink nearly as much as you should, so your eyes are drying out. And anytime you have a light emitting display, that's additional strain mm -hmm. on your eyes. So that's really cool. But is it available on? It's yeah, it's free. It was actually uh, like you know for an old version of, uh, of OS X, but it worked uh, it worked on you know Mountain Lion or whatever uh, it was on at the time. Cool. Uh, so I was, I was glad I was able to use it. Nice. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. I've been kind of looking toward apps like that, um, especially uh, I was just talking with Don the other day about carpal tunnel. I'm really concerned. My, both my parents have had carpal tunnel mm -hmm. surgery, and obviously anytime you do a repetitive motion that we're, that we're doing, there's concern for that. So I've been kind of looking toward like exercises, exercises I can do to help mm -hmm. alleviate that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I need to look into that as well, because uh, 
because I play music and I know if I mess if I mess up my wrist, I'm you're done. done. <laughs> I was, I was a gymnast when I was younger, so um, all my joints pop and crack, so I, I'm sure that doesn't help either. <laughs> I found some numbers for the caffeine and chocolate. Okay. <laughs> a two ounce piece of 80% dark chocolate has 91 milligrams of caffeine, and just for reference, this has 34. Oh, so I was wrong. Three cans of soda with caffeine. Okay. And this one's chocolate. How much chocolate? Okay. I couldn't hear that. Could you repeat it? Oh, um, two ounces of 80% dark chocolate from Amana has 91 milligrams of caffeine, and this has 34. Do they make decaf? Is, is, there, a, is there a difference in the type of caffeine? Possibly. Uh, yeah, that, that might be something to look into. Yeah, and uh, chocolate's going to be naturally occurring. Right. Mm -hmm. Whereas what's in a Coke is still somewhat naturally occurring, I guess, but introduced. <laughs> I mean, caffeine's caffeine. So. Right. Yeah, I, I, so I need to do a little more research there. Um, but yeah. Anybody else? Peter, wake up. <laughs> cool. All right, so I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you.